Dear you and Rebecca Smith of the National Employment Law Project, on this hearing, which is about a case before the Commission, Leopoldo Zumaya and Francisco Berman Lizalde, uh, uh, United States. Uh, so we will give each of you the normal 20 minutes uh, to proceed. Uh, I am here today joined with former President of the Commission, Commissioner Felipe Gonzalez. Gonzalez. We will shortly be joined by former President Tracy Robinson in a couple of minutes or so, but we would like to start today. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present today on behalf of our clients, Leopoldo Zumaya and Francisco Berriman Lizalde, both of whom experienced discriminatory denial of their right to equal protection under the law before the courts in violation of Articles 2, 17, and 18 of the American Declaration. Mr. Zumaya and Mr. Lizalde were among the approximately 8 million or more undocumented workers in the United States. Laboring in notoriously dangerous jobs, they both had the grave misfortune of being injured on the job. Mr. Lizalde fell while pruning out an apple tree in South Central Pennsylvania, fracturing his tibia and tearing multiple tendons, one of the worst injuries of its kind that one of his treating doctors had ever seen. Mr. Lizalde fell while working as a painter, fracturing his hand. Both workers were left severely restricted in the work they could do and were clearly entitled to workers' compensation benefits. While the workers' compensation statutes applicable to Mr. Zumaya and Mr. Lizalde's cases do not facially discriminate on the basis of immigration status, both men were denied equal rights and remedies as their U.S. citizen counterparts. Following the U.S. Supreme Court's Hoffman Plastic decision, the U.S. legal system, policies, and practices allow for immigration enforcement to trump a worker's rights and to a full, equal, and effective remedy. The impact on undocumented workers experiencing discrimination on the job, sexual harassment, retaliation for engaging in organizing activities, and workplace injuries is real. As Mr. Zumaya and Mr. Lizalde's cases illustrate, and has, say, has been set forth in greater detail in our written submissions, U.S. federal and state law, policy, and practice often condones and in some cases facilitates discrimination against workers on the basis of immigration status, even when those workers are statutorily covered. We appreciate the work this administration has done to try to limit the impact of the Hoffman decision and its efforts to make available some forms of immigration relief to a limited number of workers who have experienced egregious workplace rights violations or are engaged in ongoing labor disputes. However, these efforts have not gone far enough to fulfill the United States' obligations to ensure that workers, once engaged in an employment relationship, are able to realize their right to non-discrimination and equality, as set forth under international law and as articulated in the Inter-American Courts Advisory Opinion, OC18. Unfortunately, neither Mr. Zumaya nor Mr. Lizalde is available to testify today before the Commission. Both workers are now back in Mexico and lack the ability and the resources to seek humanitarian parole in the hopes of obtaining a visa to travel to the United States, a costly and cumbersome process with questionable outcomes at best. Instead, you will hear the video recorded testimony of Mr. Lizalde, taken near his home in Durango. He describes the call he received from the insurance company after his hand had been operated on, inquiring into his immigration status. Shortly after that call, and just before he had a scheduled appointment for his workers' compensation impairment rating evaluation, he was arrested at his home by immigration and put in jail, leaving his wife and U.S. citizen daughter without their family's sole provider. He was criminally prosecuted for use of false documents by a U.S. attorney who has publicly stated that undocumented workers filing for workers' compensation could find themselves prosecuted and faced up to a year or more in jail. Knowing only that he could not support his family from jail, he pled guilty and was deported. As Mr. Lizalde's workers' compensation attorney has attested, when he filed Mr. Lizalde's claim for workers' compensation in the days after Mr. Lizalde was deported, the U.S. attorney who had prosecuted Mr. Lizalde called his office, asking whether Mr. Lizalde had illegally re-entered, effectively serving as a warning against, a continu against continuing to pursue relief. The believed actions of the insurance company, in cooperation with law enforcement, served to terminate Mr. Lizalde's claim to compensation. Following Mr. Lizalde's video testimony, you will hear from Professor Beth Lyon, director of the Farmworker Legal Aid Clinic at Villanova University School of Law, and an expert in workers' compensation, particularly as applied to immigrant workers. Professor Lyon will explain the state of workers' compensation law in Pennsylvania, the impact of that state's decision in reinforced earth, 
a decision rent rendered shortly after the Hoffman decision and marking a change in Pennsylvania compensation law as applied to undocumented workers. As a result of that decision, Mr. Zumaya had no real choice but to accept a settlement offer for a fraction of what would have been paid out to a similarly situated citizen worker. While the question of exhaustion raised in the government's response brief is moot, as the Commission has already ruled on admissibility, Professor Lyon's testimony will confirm petitioner's assertions that undocumented workers like Mr. Zumaya are routinely denied their right to full and equal remedy under the state's workers' compensation system. Finally, Rebecca Smith, Deputy Director of the National Employment Law Project and co-counsel to petitioners, will put Mr. Lizalde and Mr. Zumaya's experiences in the national context and will set forth our request for relief and recommendations. Thank you. Yo estuve trabajando en Wichita, Kansas y estuve trabajando lo que es en la, en la pintura pintando casas y edificios y escuelas y todas esas cosas estábamos pintando en en un edificio de, de cinco niveles y allá dentro de la altura era más o menos como de unos 20 pies y yo estaba a una altura como de 16 pies y no alcanzaba hasta arriba y subí una escalera al andamio donde yo estaba pintando y fue cuando, cuando me caí. Pues ya después mmm, voy al hospital y me, me operan, porque ya cuando estaba ahí en prisión yo sentía algo adentro del yeso, sino que ya después de que me lo, de que me lo quitaron, pues yo mire que, que me salieron los, los clavos ahí. Pues sí, sí la tengo un poquito, poquito chueca la mano. Pues porque siento que no, no tengo el movimiento que debo, de, que debo de tener. Sí, pues después de que yo salgo del hospital, que estoy en recuperación, me empezaron a llegar los, los, los cheques, me llegaron tres cheques, como por 400 dólares, 400 y algo. Este, lo, me habló la, la aseguranza, fue la que me habló, para checar mis, mis datos, mi nombre y mis datos, mi número de seguro social, para ver si era bueno o era malo. Pues cuando ella me dijo que si el seguro era bueno, pues, pues yo no le eché mentira, yo le dije que no era bueno. Porque de todos modos, aunque yo le dijera que era bueno, pues ella de todas maneras lo iba a checar e iba a mirar que no, que no era bueno. Y ya nomás me dijo que estaba bien, que en unos días más me iba a volver a, se iba a comunicar conmigo. No, ya no, porque a los poquitos días este, llegó la migración por mí hasta allá, hasta la casa. Y este, pues la mujer fue la que le abrió. Y después de que me llevan a, a la prisión, pues, pues mi mujer pues no trabajaba. Se quedaron ella y la niña ahí en la casa. Y yo era el único que, pues, que trabajaba, pues. Pues yo creo que la aseguradora fue la, fue la que la que le abrió a la, la migración para que fueran por mí. Pues porque checaron mi, mi número de seguro social y yo creo, miran que no era, no era bueno y pues yo creo que se les hizo más fácil deportarme que que es quedarme dinero pues los cargos eran de que por tener documentación falsa y estar ilegalmente en, en Estados Unidos pues la misma corte ahí le da uno una, un abogado que lo representa pues yo conocí a mi, a mi abogado a través de la, de la corte y, y el proceso fue de que el abogado me decía que si yo me daba por culpable, era más fácil que me, que me deportaran. Dijo, y si no firmas, pues vas a durar un, un año ahí en prisión o dos. Dijo, yo no sé qué tanto puedas durar. Dijo, y si firmas tu, tu deportación, dijo, pues luego, luego te, van a, te van a deportar y ya no vas a estar más aquí haciendo tiempo. Pues del trabajo que hizo el abogado, pues si él me dice que pues que firmara para que, para que ya no estuviera ahí en prisión, pues, pues así, a mí se me hizo bien, porque pues yo ya lo que quería era que me deportaran, pues porque yo ya no quería estar ahí en prisión. Pues los compañeros sí me decían que, que aguantara, que, que no firmara nada, pero que no sabían, pues sí que no sabían qué tanto tiempo podía durar ahí en, en prisión, pues. Pues porque ellos saben, saben muchas cosas ahí cuando ahí adentro, o sea, ellos saben 
pues como ya ellos han estado tiempo atrás ahí en prisión, pues ellos saben y, y uno, pues como es la primera vez que cae uno en prisión, pues no sabe, no sabe uno nada. Y ellos ahí le informan a uno, pues qué es lo que tenga que hacer uno qué, o qué no hacer. Pues yo pienso que sí fue la, la aseguradora la que la que me echó la migración, pues. No, pues pienso que fue injusto, pues, lo que me hicieron. Pues a lo mejor digo yo que si ellos me hubieran, pues póngale que no me hubieran llevado a prisión, que me hubieran dado por decir un tiempo como, como para salir de Estados Unidos y yo pues yo me hubiera salido, pero no pues que me hubieran encerrado. Pues a lo mejor esto que me pasó a mí, este, pues que le sirviera de experiencia a otras, a otras personas que están ilegalmente en Estados Unidos que no quisiera pues, que les pasara lo mismo. Bueno, mis compañeros me comentaron que, que lo que me habían hecho, este, supuestamente yo porque estaba de, de ilegal en Estados Unidos, y ellos me comentaban que fue más ilegal lo que hicieron ellos conmigo porque no deberían de haber hecho eso. Que lo legal era este, pues, que me hubieran, hubiera tenido una compensación al trabajador. Y por eso me comentaban ellos de que de que habían sido ellos más ilegales que, que uno que estar sin documentos en, en Estados Unidos. Honorable commissioners, good afternoon. For 14 years, my clinic has represented injured, undocumented immigrant workers whose benefits have been denied or who've been fired when they sought workers' compensation protection. Thank you for this opportunity to explain how Hoffman plastic compounds directly contributed to gutting a fundamental protection for undocumented workers in Pennsylvania. The workers' compensation scheme is a centuries-old Anglo-Saxon law compromise between employers and workers. Employers must pay for medical costs, a percentage of lost wages, and in some states, vocational rehabilitation for workers who are hurt on the job. And in return for these protections, workers lose the right to sue in tort in state court for bigger damages like pain and suffering. This system of workers' compensation provides more certainty to companies and to workers with lower level but more dependable protection while still providing a continuous incentive to make the workplace safer. The post Hoffman Plastic state cases like Reinforced Earth Company versus Workers' Compensation Appeal Board throw out that compromise by sharply cutting protection for undocumented workers. Reinforced Earth was a November 2002 decision of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court that precisely mirrored Hoffman Plastic compounds in its analytical approach. With one hand, the court reiterated a long-held principle that undocumented workers were entitled to the protection of a fundamental workers' rights statute, in this case, workers' compensation. But with the other hand, the court gutted the protection it was supposedly preserving. Explicitly in the text of the reinforced earth uh, opinion, the court stripped away the right to compensatory pay for wages that partially injured undocumented workers had lost as a result of their employment injury. The court held that if a worker is only partly disabled, that worker will not be compensated for her lost wages because her inability to work should be legally blamed on her undocumented status, not on the disability that the work injury caused. This ruling represented a radical change in Pennsylvania jurisprudence. Because it is extremely unlikely that an injured worker will be found to be totally disabled, this decision meant that virtually all workers' compensation claims by undocumented workers became medicals only. In other words, most injured undocumented workers in Pennsylvania will receive no lost wages at all. As a result, the workers' compensation bar, the attorneys in Pennsylvania who handle workers' compensation cases, lost their financial incentive to accept cases for injured undocumented workers. Unless a clinic such as mine is willing to litigate a case for medicals only and pay the extreme cost of handling these cases using medical experts and other experts, workers are forced to settle their medical claims for pennies on the dollar, leaving them without any further support for their medical needs, let alone any income for, to care for themselves or for their families. Moreover, 
By making immigration status legally relevant, Reinforced Earth has made pursuing workers' compensation benefits a terrifying proposition for undocumented people. Placing their immigration status on the record in a deposition, in an administrative hearing, in a court hearing is a risk that some workers are unwilling to take, causing them to abandon even the limited rights that they do have. Recently, an employer-side workers' compensation defense lawyer confided in me that she is ashamed of the low settlements that she's able to command in undocumented worker cases. She stated that her own clients, the employers, are saving money every day by deliberately un employing undocumented workers and then raising their immigration status as a defense, as a shield in workers' compensation litigation. Now, the dissent in the Reinforced Earth case would have gone even farther and stripped undocumented workers of all of their rights under the Pennsylvania Workers' Compensation Act. The dissent quoted Hoffman plastic compounds extensively. It was clear to us in the Pennsylvania Workers' Compensation Bar, in legal services, and to the judges that I've interviewed that Reinforced Earth was strongly influenced by the emotion following the tragic events of 9-11 and by Hoffman plastic compounds itself. It is also clear to us that our state has used a legal fiction about the unavailability of work to undocumented immigrants to discriminate against some of its most vulnerable workers. Thank you. Good morning and thank you. I'm Rebecca Smith from the National Employment Law Project. As you've heard today, Mr. Benjamin Lizalde and Mr. Sumaya were injured on the job like thousands of immigrant workers every year in our country. Had they lived in places other than Pennsylvania and Kansas, they might have received lost wages and medical benefits and returned to work successfully. But Mr. Sumaya was injured in Pennsylvania, where the law limits the compensation he can receive because he is unauthorized to work. And Mr. Beremen Lizalde was even less fortunate. He not only lost out on the benefits to which he's legally entitled, but he was criminally prosecuted and deported, likely as a result of filing his claim for workers' compensation. Unfortunately, these petitioners' experience is not unique. U.S. law and practice with respect to the labor rights of unauthorized workers varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. There are places where workers may not receive full compensation for work-related injuries, like Pennsylvania and Kansas others where they may not be accorded full remedies for discrimination on the job, and everywhere in the United States, unauthorized workers who exercise their fundamental freedom of association and then are fired get no remedy whatsoever. This formal denial of certain remedies for unauthorized workers has had other effects. First, incidences of actual retaliation, like that suffered by Mr. Benjamin Lizalde and others uh, as illustrated in our materials, and of course, workers' legitimate fear of retaliation. And second, where workers do have the temerity to file a complaint for abuses on the job, many employers will aggressively try to force them to disclose their status in the context of judicial proceedings. And those have resulted in a climate in which the labor rights of undocumented workers can frequently be abused with impunity. The lack of uniformity in legal protections and outcomes has forced workers to litigate and relitigate their entitlement to certain remedies on a case-by-case -case basis and in many jurisdictions. Frequently, the right of access to the courts is a theoretical not an actual one for these workers. There have been some governmental efforts to enforce labor laws regardless of migration status, including some measure, measures to separate immigration enforcement from labor law enforcement and offer limited relief in response to or in anticipation of retaliation, but these remedies are not widely available and abuses continue. The United States must commit itself to protection of all workers regardless of their migration status in order to be in compliance with human rights law. And our recommendations to the Commission fall along two lines. For the individual petitioners, appropriate steps must be taken, including allowing them reentry into the United States if necessary to pursue remaining claims, and for all other undocumented workers affected by discrimination, 
amend national and state laws and policies and practice that discriminate against unauthorized workers, specifically correct the Hoffman Plastics decision. But in the short term, there are reforms that can be administratively implemented now and that would move the U.S. closer to the rule of the Inter-American Court that the migratory status of a person can never be a justification for depriving him of the enjoyment and exercise of his human rights, including those related to employment. The U.S. can first take steps to ensure that all undocumented workers in the midst of labor disputes can claim the right to remain in the United States and work. It can strengthen existing policies that prevent employers and others from using a worker's immigration status as a tool in labor disputes, and it can educate and instruct courts and other officials on the limits of the Hoffman decision, prohibit judicial and agency inquiries into immigration status, and work with state officials to ensure that they are in compliance with these norms. These interim steps can help ensure that only workers directly affected by the Hoffman decision suffer discrimination in the near term. On behalf of the petitioners, I thank you for your thoughtful consideration of this issue. It is of vital importance to the some 8 million undocumented workers who contribute every day to our economy and our society. Thank you. Please. Thank you, distinguished commissioners, distinguished members of the commission, secretariat staff, and representatives of civil society. My name is Anthony Pahagian, and I'm the alternate representative at the U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States. Thank you for the opportunity here to appear here today to discuss the merits of this petition. The United States oral arguments in this case will be presented by members of the State Department's Office of the Legal Advisor, Mr. J. Bischoff and Marianne Grove. We also have observers with us today from the Department of Homeland Security Civil Rights Office, Mr. Bruce Friedman, and from the Department of Labor's Solicitor's Office, Ms. Jane Garrido. We would re reiterate for the record that we appear here to address the merits of this specific petition. We will not be engaging on broader thematic issues related to undocumented workers. I'll now turn the floor over to my colleagues. Jay. Thank you very much. Distinguished commissioners, it is an honor uh, to appear before you again today. The United States strongly supports the Commission's work to advance the protection and promotion of human rights throughout our hemisphere, and we reaffirm its autonomy and its independence. We welcome this opportunity to discuss the petition brought on behalf of Leopoldo Zumaya and Francisco Beruman Lizalde. As explained more fully in our written brief, the United States respectfully disagrees that petitioners' experiences demonstrate a failure by the United States to uphold its commitments under the American Declaration. We do not believe the Commission should further consider petitioners' claims because each has failed to exhaust the domestic remedies available to him. If the Commission chooses to further consider this matter, it should deny the claims because they lack merit. While we believe the claims should be dismissed, however, we look forward to continuing our engagement with civil society and our shared goal of advancing the rights and protections of all workers, including undocumented workers. Before proceeding, we would offer three preliminary observations. First, the petitioner's briefs go into significant detail on cases of alleged employment discrimination and retaliation wholly unrelated to petitioner's claims. Yet in 2011, the Commission narrowed this matter to the claims of Mr. Sumaya and Mr. Berman Lisalde. Our remarks therefore focus on these claims. Second, we note our longstanding position that the American Declaration is a non-binding instrument that does not itself or through the OAS Charter create legal rights or impose legal obligations on states. Nonetheless, the United States faithfully respects its political commitments to uphold the Declaration. Third. We would also note that the Commission is not competent to entertain claims or issue recommendations with respect to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. It should therefore disregard petitioner's request to do so here. I will proceed with a general discussion of U.S. efforts to protect undocumented workers from unlawful discrimination and retaliation and say a few words about the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Hoffman. My colleague, Ms. Grove, 
We'll then discuss our views on admissibility and merits. All workers deserve to work in an environment where their dignity and human rights are respected. The United States is deeply committed to workers' rights and makes great efforts to protect the human rights of all workers, whether documented or not. The United States is committed to ensuring that all persons in the United States receive the protections to which they are entitled under our Constitution and laws, including applicable international obligations. Contrary to the landscape of, quote, routine nationwide discrimination, unquote, painted by the petitioners in their arguments before the commission, the United States has a comprehensive set of labor and employment laws that generally apply to all workers, regardless of immigration status. More than 180 federal laws and a far greater number of state laws aim at the protection and advancement of workers. Some of these federal laws are listed in our brief. They are vigorously enforced without regard to whether victims of violations possess work authorization. Labor and employment laws prohibit retaliation against workers who assert their rights under certain statutes. In addition, the National Labor Relations Board, Equal Opportunity Employment Commission, and Department of Labor also combat employer efforts to discover the immigration status of workers during litigation to prevent employers from threatening deportation or otherwise intimidating workers or witnesses. The United States, through numerous federal and state agencies, daily makes efforts to ensure that the rights of workers and their families under these laws are protected and that they have access to the judicial system and other programs to ensure this protection. The Department of Labor conducts directed investigations at work sites to assess employer compliance and has increased its enforcement activities in recent years through administrative action and litigation to recover back wages, assess monetary penalties, and other measures. When investigating violations, these enforcement agencies do not ask about the immigration status of the workers in question. Under a memorandum of understanding, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement refrains from engaging in civil worksite enforcement activities at work sites that are the subject of an existing Department of Labor investigation during the pendency of the investigation and any related proceeding. In addition, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission enforces, for both documented and undocumented workers, federal laws banning discrimination against a job applicant or employee on grounds including race and national origin. In addition to enforcing the law for the benefit of all workers, including those who are undocumented, the U.S. government also works hard to educate migrant workers about their rights, often in concert with civil and human rights groups. For example, the Department of Labor hosts outreach events, produces multilingual publications, and maintains a website and toll-free hotline with information for workers about their rights, including protections against retaliation. In these efforts, the United States underscores that wage and hour laws apply to all workers in the United States regardless of immigration status. The United States also engages bilaterally with OAS member states and many other governments to develop strategies for informing migrant laborers about their rights when working in the United States. For instance, the Department of Labor, in partnership with several Mexican consulates around the United States, has conducted trainings for Mexican consular staff. Petitioner's principal quarrel is with the Supreme Court's decision in Hoffman. They argue that Hoffman has influenced the development of federal and state case law in a direction unfavorable to undocumented workers' rights, and that Hoffman has fostered an environment of routine nationwide discrimination for undocumented workers. This contention is erroneous. Before we turn to the petitioner's claims, we wish to say a few words about Hoffman and its legacy. In Hoffman, the Supreme Court held that the National Labor Relations Board was foreclosed from awarding back pay for hours not worked to a worker dismissed in violation of federal labor law, but who had not been legally authorized to work in the United States under federal immigration law. Hoffman does not exclude foreign workers from coverage under federal and state labor and employment laws. Rather, the court's ruling is limited to one remedy, back pay awarded by the National Labor Relations Board to undocumented workers unlawfully terminated in violation of the National Labor Relations Act for work not performed and that could not lawfully have been performed. It is important to stress that the worker in that case was not denied back pay for work actually performed. After Hoffman, a wide range of other remedies remains available to undocumented workers, 
including compensatory and punitive damages for wrongful employment actions, em employer actions, back pay for work performed, injunction, injunctive release to stop discriminatory practices, costs, attorney's fees, and workers' compensation benefits for injured workers. The United States fully supports the availability of these remedies to undocumented workers. Moreover, federal agencies have not applied Hoffman beyond its narrow holding. For example, the National Labor Relations Board instructed its personnel in 2002 that Hoffman did not affect other actions the board could take against employers behaving unlawfully. In February of this year, the board issued a new memorandum reiterating that the National Labor Relations Act applies to undocumented workers and calling for the board to encourage investigators to use all available means to remedy unfair labor practices of employers where those who have experienced or witnessed discrimination are undocumented workers. Likewise, in 2002, the Department of Labor made clear that Hoffman did not address laws the department enforces, including the Fair Labor Standards Act and the Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection Act. Similarly, with respect to discrimination in the workplace, after Hoffman, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission released a statement stressing that the decision did not affect the government's ability to root out employment discrimination against undocumented workers. In enforcing the Civil Rights Act, the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission does not inquire into a worker's immigration status and does not consider immigration status when examining the merits of a charge. Furthermore, most federal and state courts since Hoffman have interpreted the decision narrowly. Petitioners ask the commission to recommend that we, quote, instruct our courts to rule in a certain way. As the commission knows, and as the petitioners surely know as well, under our constitutional system, the judiciary is an independent branch of government, and the executive branch cannot instruct federal or state courts on how to rule. Recognizing these separation of powers and federalism limitations, the executive branch has taken great efforts within its powers to appear in appropriate cases to argue for construing Hoffman in a way that limits its application. These efforts have met with considerable success. For example, cases following Hoffman make clear that Hoffman does not preclude recovery from, for unpaid wages under the Fair Labor Standards Act or the Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection Act or in discrimination cases under the Civil Rights Act. Courts and administrative tribunals have generally resisted attempts by employers to stretch Hoffman to make immigration status relevant during the discovery phase of litigation. State courts following Hoffman have generally held that the decision does not preclude compensation for workplace injuries or death to undocumented workers. As petitioners admit, most litigation has ultimately resulted in undocumented workers being found eligible for remedies and courts have tended to recognize wrongdoing on the part of employers toward undocumented workers. We now turn to the specific claims brought by the petitioners, Mr. Zumaya and Mr. Baruman Lizalde. The petitioners allege the United States has failed to uphold several commitments under the American Declaration by denying the petitioners a portion of their workers' compensation claims. We respectfully submit, however, that the Commission should not further consider either claim because the petitioners have not, in fact, exhausted their domestic remedies as stipulated under Article 31 of the Commission's rules. Article 31 essentially means that a claimant should present his or her claim to an appropriate domestic court, support the claim with all relevant evidence and legal arguments, and take advantage of all procedures for appeal. The petitioners would excuse their failure to exhaust by asserting that they are unlikely to succeed. But even if the likelihood of success or failure could be established other than through taking actual steps to exhaust remedies, the Commission itself has recognized that, quote, mere doubt as to the prospect of success in going to court is not sufficient to exempt a petitioner from exhausting domestic remedies, unquote. The holding in Hoffman, which limits recourse by undocumented workers to back pay for work they did not and could not perform lawfully, is not relevant to petitioners' situations, where each sought workers' compensation benefits due to on-the-job injuries. Nevertheless, Mr. Zumaya argues that because of a Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision purportedly inspired by Hoffman, litigating his claim in the Pennsylvania courts would have been futile. 
He therefore chose to settle the claim for what he asserts is a lesser amount than he should have received. Yet this Pennsylvania decision, reinforced earth, does not prevent totally disabled doc undocumented workers from receiving disability benefits, nor does it impact payments for medical expenses for totally or partially disabled undocumented workers. Thus, Mr. Zumaya could have sought total disability benefits for whatever time he was totally disabled and could have pursued his employer for ceasing to pay his medical bills, including for any time during which he was partially disabled. With nothing more than doubt as to the success of his claim, Mr. Zumaya chose for his own reasons not to pursue his domestic remedies and instead reached a settlement. He has thus failed to show that attempting to recover dis disability benefits and medical expenses would have been futile. Similarly, Mr. Berumen Lazalde has chosen not to pursue workers' compensation claim, his workers' compensation claim in Kansas State Court, and argues that it would be impossible because he has been deported, and in any case unlikely to succeed. But Mr. Berumen Lazalde cannot avoid the exhaustion requirement in this way. He has not shown that making such a claim would be futile, nor has he demonstrated that it would be practically impossible or even substantially burdensome to do so. First, Mr. Berumen Lazalde has not shown that pursuing his claim in the Kansas courts would have been futile. Although the court in Doe upheld a civil fine against an undocumented worker for her use of a false name, it left intact the worker's compensation benefits she had received, noting that she was legally entitled to those benefits. Though Mr. Berumen Lazalde might have had to pay a fine for his use of a false identity, he has not shown that a Kansas court would deny him his worker's compensation benefits. Second, he has not shown sufficiently that he could not re-enter the United States for the purpose of litigating his claim. To our knowledge, Mr. Berumen Lazalde has not applied for a visa to re-enter the United States to file his worker's compensation claim, nor has he applied for humanitarian parole, which is available for participation in civil litigation. Third, Mr. Berumen Lizalde has not demonstrated anything other than personal doubt as to the prospects of litigating his claim without his physical presence in court. He admits that a court could allow the case to go forward in his absence in light of the circumstances. Further, while Mr. Berumen Lizalde's attorney asserts that he has heard U.S. doctors are unlikely to travel into Mexico to perform the medical examination required to prove a worker's compensation claim, there has apparently been no attempt to determine whether a doctor would actually be willing to do so. Because neither claimant appears to have fully pursued his claims in U.S. court, domestic court, the Commission should decline to consider them further. Even if the Commission were to consider the merits of the petitioner's claims, it should find that the petitioners have not shown that their experiences demonstrate a failure by the United States to live up to its commitments under the American Declaration. With respect to Mr. Zumaya's claims, although the petitioners point to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's decision in reinforced earth in support of their position, the majority opinion does not mention Hoffman and implicitly rejected extending it to the Pennsylvania workers' compensation scheme. Indeed, reinforced earth expressed the principle that undocumented workers are eligible for workers' compensation, which includes medical expenses and wage loss compensation even when a worker has obtained employment by submitting fraudulent documentation. Had Mr. Zumaya chosen to pursue his claim rather than settle, a Pennsylvania court could well have found the termination of his medical benefits impermissible and that he was entitled to wage loss compensation benefits during the period when he was totally disabled. With respect to Mr. Berumen Lizalde's claims, the Kansas Supreme Court case Doe actually upheld a claim by an undocumented worker for workers' compensation. Like reinforced earth, the majority opinion makes no mention of Hoffman. The Doe decision did allow a fine to the undocumented worker for using a false name and identity in filing her workers' compensation claim. But the court explained this was not an unreasonable procedural barrier, for a person's identity is needed in workers' compensation cases in order to verify medical and wage history, 
which are relevant in computing disability benefits and protects against fraud and abuse. The petitioners also raise a second concern regarding Mr. Berum and Lizalde, specifically that the U.S. Attorney's Office in Kansas worked with employers to prosecute undocumented workers who file workers' compensation claims. They note that Mr. Berumen Lizalde suspects he was prosecuted and deported in retaliation for filing a claim. However, neither the petition nor the most recent filing include any specific evidence linking the arrest to Mr. Berumen Lizalde's claims. Further, what the petitioners call a policy of the U.S. Attorney's Office was nothing of the sort. The document they rely on in this contention was an unofficial presentation given by the assistant U.S. attorney in 2006 to a small group of attorneys. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Kansas has never had a policy of targeting undocumented immigrants who file compensation claims. Nevertheless, the Department of Justice will continue to enforce the criminal laws relating to identity theft and document fraud. We would remind the Commission that Article 33 of the Declaration recognizes, quote, the duty of every person to obey the law and other legitimate commands of the authorities of his country and those of the country in which he may be, end quote. Because the relevant law suggests that the relief both claimants seek may well be available to them had they chosen to pursue their claims in state court, the, petition, the claims of petitioners do not demonstrate that the United States has failed to live up to its commitments under the American Declaration. In conclusion, the United States respectfully requests that the Commission deny the petition. Regardless of the outcome of this case, we will continue our substantial efforts to ensure that all workers, including undocumented workers, are appropriately paid for work performed and injuries sustained, are not subjected to unsafe, discriminatory, or hostile working conditions, and are guaranteed freedom of association and collective bargaining rights. We look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. I will ask the country rapporteur, who uh, is also the rapporteur on the rights of migrant workers, former president, Commissioner, Commissioner Felipe um, Gonzalez, to speak, please. Thank you, Madam President. I um, would like to make a, a, a few short comments and, and some questions. Um, first about the issue of, uh, of uh, the exhaustion of uh, domestic remedies, this was an issue that was uh, already uh, assessed by the Commission at its admissibility report. Uh, that's the reason why we are now at, the, at this hearing on, on the merits, as uh, the case is at the merit stage. So that point was already discussed um, during the, the admissibility stage uh, uh, of the proceedings. Um, concerning the, the, the third and the international covenant on civil and political rights, the Commission does not establish uh, responsibilities of any state of the OAS based on those uh, instruments, but it can use them uh, as well as other instruments uh, from the UN uh, to interpret the scope of the provisions of the Inter-American instruments, just to clarify that point. Now, I think there are two kind of issues here that both uh, uh, the petitioners and the state have raised. Some of them uh, have to uh, do with the, 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 the specific uh, findings of the case and where the Commission should or not establish that uh, uh, there is a responsibility of the United States uh, for the um, violation of uh, the American Declaration of uh, the Rights and Duties of Men in this uh, case, and the general situation um, of uh, the rights of migrant workers in the United States. The, because this is a specific case involving two alleged victims, um, the Commission uh, will focus on the first uh, issue. Uh, this is nonetheless, uh, this is, the, no, this is uh, regardless of the fact that the Commission might uh, provide some, ana some analysis in its uh, uh, final report 
uh, about the general situation that in, in terms that uh, might have an impact uh, that context in the situation of these two persons in particular. And also, uh, the, it would be interesting in this regard to hear more from the uh, parties. Uh, it might be a matter that in case the Commission uh, finds, that, uh, finds the state uh, responsible, in case, if that occurred, uh, the, the, the scope of the reparations uh, would be important uh, for the scope of the reparations uh, would be important to have a, a general picture about the situation. So it's not that the Commission as such, as in a country report, will uh, analyze in detail the general situation of migrant workers, but rather that might be useful, uh, especially uh, if the, some reparations uh, are the ordered by the Commission. Um, it seems to me that there are some, how can I say, there, there, there are a number of issues that have been uh, told to us in this regard, in regard to the general situation. Um, in fact, uh, I heard at the beginning of the presentation by petitioners that uh, they consider that there have been some progress uh, on the part of the, the federal government in this regard over the last few years. Um, and the, the government also uh, described a number of policies in this regard. Again, uh, this is not uh, directly re uh, related to the finding of the Commission regarding the, the alleged victims, but it is important to get a, an updated uh, description of the context and also if the Commission uh, finds a responsibility on the part of the state to determine the scope of the reparations. So I would ask the, uh, both parties to elaborate more in this regard. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Well, I found this uh, hearing to be very intriguing, perhaps because I'm a labor lawyer and a lawyer in another life. But uh, thankfully, we are not called upon today to determine the merits of the decision. And of course, I agree with my colleague about the exhaustion of remedies point, which has already been determined, but the merits point will be determined at a later date. And um, I think that is important because there, it, it seems to hinge for me on the interpretations of case law, because we got two completely different accounts of what the cases actually mean, Hoffman, uh, the plastics on the one hand, and the reinforced case. And of course, we don't have the cases before us, so it's, it's difficult to say yay or nay as to what it really means. I do believe that um, this case could or would bring to bear our Article 26, which has to do with uh, the regression of rights, and we are now very occupied, preoccupied with that whole principle of uh, economic rights and so on. These sorts of um, ideas, it, 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 it reminds me of these sorts of issues that may, may bring us to some sort of consideration as a gen and as a general principle as to whether you had rights before and whether you went backward, if that is the correct interpretation of, of the reinforced case. But that is for a future date. I just wanted to ask, although I have said that we have different interpretations of the cases, I wanted to ask the state whether they accept that the reinforced case makes a distinction between partial disability and total disability. That is the one. I don't think it's, it's useful for us to argue about who, what the, which case says what. But I didn't hear a specific comment about that, because the petitioners are saying it may, there's a dichotomy now, now because of this new case or um, reinforce that there is this clear distinction that you could get workers' compensation if you're wholly disabled, but you couldn't if you're partially disabled. I would like to hear a specific comment from you on that because you did give us your own uh, very detailed um, view of how that case has been interpreted, but I didn't quite hear that. And just to say generally on the point uh, that was raised about changing the law, seeking to change the law, if that's the effect. Yes, clearly we all accept 
that there's separation of powers. You can't ask the courts, God forbid, um, to, to decide in any particular way, but you could as a responsible state if you do believe that uh, case law is going on in the wrong direction, which is um, contributing to the violation of human rights, which you, uh, the state has said they uphold, that you could have legislative intervention to rectify. So I think that is what um, we would want to look for, not to ask this, the courts to rule otherwise. Uh, thank you. With the three minutes on each side to respond. Thank you. Thank you for your observations and for your comments. I feel like this is the case where the chasm between rights and realities, rights on paper and realities for the workers is significant. Uh, and, and while we are here to discuss the cases of Mr. Lizalde and Mr. Zumaya, unfortunately they can't be completely isolated from the broader context in which undocumented workers are working and the state of the case law and uh, enforcement in the United States. I'm gonna to turn to my colleague, Rebecca Smith, to talk a little bit about the scope of reparations. Thank you. You had asked about efforts that the United States had already taken, and I can just outline three and tell you of their limitations. There is a memorandum of understanding between the Immigration Service and the Department of Labor that attempts to separate investigations of the one from the other, but it applies only to investigations by the Department of Labor, not by other federal agencies, not by state agencies, and of course not in private litigation where workers are trying to claim their rights. There are some visas that are available to workers, but only if they are victims of workplace crimes. So those are similarly limited. And then there is a policy that says that ordinarily, workers who are victims of uh, workplace uh, civil rights or other rights violations should be allowed to re remain in the country in order to pursue those claims. But that policy has never really been implemented. And so for the few who might be aware of the policy, they can try to claim it, but it's also uh, discretionary. It's called prosecutorial discretion. Thank you. Um, I wanted to address one point raised by the honorable represent representatives of the government, and that was the point that um, it may be necessary to prove your immigration status in order to, um, to demonstrate your identity for the purposes of seeking workers' compensation, um, if I understood it properly. And to that point, um, it's very rare to have to prove your identity in the medical system um, for undocumented uh, workers, in my experience, in Pennsylvania, or to have to prove it as you're working your way through the workers' compensation system. But to the extent that you might have to do that, you can certainly demonstrate that by showing a birth certificate or by um, testifying, not necessarily by proving your immigration status. Thank you. Thanks for those questions. Um, I'm just going to run through them quickly. Um, first, about uh, the question of exhaustion, uh, it, all I can say in that regard is uh, the United States um, you know, made its views on exhaustion known for the first time in its brief filed last year. And uh, we believe those considerations are still relevant, and the commission should, should take them for what they're worth. Um, uh, and still many of those considerations bear on the merits. Uh, it sort of has to be considered together, we believe. Um, to the question um, about uh, the, you know, that this case hinges on the interpretation of, of case law, that's, that's absolutely true. And, and uh, you know, the commission should have this in regard, you know, in mind, as I'm, as I'm sure it will, as it evaluates this case. You know, we've said uh, a number of times before, you know, that the commission, it, it, you know, it is not an appeals court, is not another level, another instance of review for U.S. state or federal decisions. And so there's an appropriate sort of scope of review there that, that just needs to be taken into account. And, um, and uh, with, with respect to the question of whether reinforced earth makes a distinction between partal, partial and total disability, it, it does appear to draw that distinction. Um, but we would, we would reinforce the, the following point, and that's that uh, Pennsylvania's 
procedure for modifying a worker's compensation award requires employers to refer workers to an open job that they are eligible to take. Uh, were the court and reinforce earth to have required this step with respect to undocumented workers, the result would have been that even when an undocumented worker's condition improves, no change in benefits could be possible. Undocumented workers would then continue to receive total disability compensation indefinitely, even though they are no longer totally disabled. When faced with this question, the court chose to follow labor law principles tying workers' compensation benefits to the source of the worker's loss of earning power. Reinforced Earth can be viewed as an application of classic workers' compensation law, where a worker is owed compensation for work lost as a result of his or her injury. In that sense, labor principles remain the paramount guide. Contrary to the petitioner's claim, this is not an instance of immigration law trumping labor law. So I just, we thought it would be important for the commission to, to have that somewhat different conceptualization of what Reinforced Earth was trying to do in account when it considers this case. Um, and then finally, with respect to, you know, what, what are the remedies here? What could possibly be done if the state is found responsible um, uh, for failing to live up to its political commitments under the declaration? Um, I would also remind the, the, the commission, uh, you, you know, there are federalism hurdles in this regard. The federal, the federal policy, I believe, is very clear, as we've tried to lay out today and as we laid out in our written brief. Um, and we'll continue to fight for full worker equality, regardless of, of, of immigration status, regard, regardless of documentation status, while at the same time, as we've also said, enforcing you know, uh, appropriately the criminal law and the immigration law against those who, who commit violations. Um, and, but nonetheless, that, you know, those, those matters should not factor into decisions on workers' remedies under labor and employment law. And we'll continue to make that fight. We'll continue to appear in appropriate cases to argue to courts that that's the right way to view these cases. Um, and with respect to federal, I suppose, federal legislation to sort of rectify whatever concerns there may be, I, I just would point out there is also a, a, an issue there potentially in that a lot of these labor law issues fall traditionally within the, the jurisdiction of the, of the states and the territories. Um, and so uh, only to point out that those are certain other federalism hurdles in that regard and the commission is very familiar with, with that sort of uh, concern in the various federal states of the Americas. And I believe that that takes care of it for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you again to the State of the United States for coming to respond to these questions that were raised in this specific um, merits, uh, hearing on the merits of this specific case. And thank you also to our petitioners uh, for bringing information and for the video, which were all very helpful information for us uh, when we do sit down to determine this merit decision. Thank you again. Bye.